going to talk about a third epistemic or potentially epistemic, we'll see, attitude that um, comes up in the context of discussions about um, science and the existence of God, namely the attitude of faith. So the central question for the talk today is um, what is the role of faith in rational inquiry, in credence formation, and belief formation. I think um, it can sort of help us all to get a better, better handle on what this attitude is and under what circumstances, if any, it's rational to have this attitude, and in particular, whether it's rational to have this attitude towards the existence of God. Um, so I'm going to sort of take it as a starting point that our statements about faith in religious and mundane matters express the same attitude. So here are um, just some examples of statements um, which include the term faith. So I have faith in your abilities. I have faith in you. Um, he has faith that his spouse won't cheat on him. She acted on faith. It was an act of faith. Uh, I have faith in God's goodness. I have faith in God. Um, these are sort of very common statements. Um, so the sort of first thing I want to do in this talk uh, is figure out what exactly these statements have in common or what, what it means to have faith in a proposition. Um, so the first step is to delineate the set of propositions that are even appropriate objects for faith. Um, so here are a couple principles that uh, seem true. First, it seems that you cannot have or lack faith in a proposition unless you care about whether it's true. So to say something like, I have faith that the Nile is the longest river in Africa, um, that's an in inappropriate statement. It's false, but it's not false because I lack faith that the Nile is the longest river in Africa. It's just that since I actually don't care about whether or not that's true or false, um, that proposition is not an appropriate attitude of faith. Similarly, uh, you cannot have or lack faith in a proposition unless you have a positive attitude towards its truth. So to say, um, I have faith that despite your efforts, you will continue smoking, um, that wouldn't be a, an apt statement. It's not that I lack faith that you'll continue smoking. Again, it's that um, your continuing to smoke is not an appropriate object of faith because I don't have a positive attitude towards that proposition. Um, Finally, it seems like you cannot have or lack faith in a proposition if you're certain on the basis of your evidence alone that that proposition is true. Um, for example, it seems like I cannot have faith that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Um, on the contrary, I'm certain of that. So um, the only appropriate uh, objects of faith seem to be propositions where we're not, in fact, certain of their, their truth. For all we know, it's possible that they might be false. Okay, so what does it take to have faith in one of these propositions? Having faith seems compatible with having lots of evidence for, lots of evidence against, or no evidence either way. So it seems like um, you can sort of appropriately say, my friend has kept my confidence many times over, so I have faith that she will uh, continue to keep my secret this time. But it also seems like you can aptly say, um, despite the fact that my friend has blabbed every secret I've ever told her, I have faith that this time will be different. Now, um, maybe that's going to be an example of misplaced faith, but it wouldn't be inappropriate in this case um, to say that we have or lack an attitude towards that proposition. Um, similarly, it seems like you can have faith in something if you just have no evidence either way. So um, having faith is compatible with kind of any level of evidence except a level of evidence that would bring you to certainty. So another thing that having faith in a proposition seems to indicate is that you are willing to act on that proposition in situations that involve taking a risk. Um, however, it seems like you might have faith relative to one action but not another. So uh, you might have faith in God when it comes to the matter of um, devoting yourself to Bible study every morning, but you might lack faith in God when it comes to uh, being willing to be martyred for, for uh, belief in God. Um, so there's sort of, uh, you might have faith relative to one act, but not another. Um, next, uh, faith seems to involve a kind of commitment. Um, Perhaps it's a commitment to the proposition itself. Perhaps it's a commitment to something else. That's one thing we're going to figure out today. Um, and the final sort of piece of the puzzle, and this is going to be the main focus of the talk, 
faith seems to require going beyond the evidence in some sense. And in what sense faith requires going beyond the evidence is going to be uh, the thing we're interested in exploring today. I will take it as a basic unit of analysis for the purposes of this talk. Um, we want to figure out what it means to have faith that x expressed by some action a. Um, now, two things to say about this. Uh, one, this doesn't yet give us like faith full stop, so faith in God full stop, rather than faith in God relative to the act of being a martyr. Um, but I think it's plausible that we'll eventually be able to analyze faith full stop in terms of um, which actions you're willing to take on faith. So uh, two possible ways to do this. One, you might think that statements of faith are contextual. So whenever we say that someone has faith or lacks faith, we're speaking um, relative to a particular context of acts. Um, another possibility is that you might think that faith comes in degrees. This is a pretty natural thought. Um, if you have some faith in God, you're willing to go to church. If you sort of don't have maximal faith in God, you're not willing to be martyred. Um, so it might be that we can figure out your degree of faith in terms of kind of which acts you're willing to do on the basis of the faith. Um, another thing to say is that there is um, a, a different important usage of faith. Here we're talking about faith um, in a proposition, but of course there's also an important use of faith, namely faith in a person. Um, so faith in God, faith in your friend. My hope is that uh, we can analyze interpersonal faith in terms of um, propositional faith. So it might be that um, you know you have faith in God because you have faith that X for a variety of propositions X about God, maybe positive propositions about God. Um, I know that, that some people go the other way, so some people sort of start with the interpersonal faith and then try to get propositional faith in terms of that. Um, I'm not going to go that route. Maybe what I say here is sort of compatible with this approach. Um, maybe not. I'm just going to sort of set that aside. OK, so um, what is it to have faith uh, that x expressed by some act A. Um, well, it seems like there are two uh, primary conditions. Uh, first is a condition on the act itself that expresses faith. It must be an act that constitutes taking a risk on x. And one sort of natural way to cash this out is that there's some alternative act um, such that if x holds, you prefer the act A. And if not x holds, you prefer the act B. So for example, um, Staying married to one's spouse is an act of faith that one's spouse is not cheating, because um, if one's spouse is not cheating, one prefers staying married. But if one's spouse is cheating, one prefers getting a divorce. Uh, telling a friend of a secret is an act of faith that the friend will keep one's secret, because if it's false that the friend will keep one's secret, you'd rather not tell her the secret. Um, you know, some religious examples, sort of the uh, example that Kierkegaard loves to talk about, uh, offering up Isaac is an act of faith that um, Isaac will bear many descendants, because if it's false that um, offering up Isaac is compatible with Isaac bearing many descendants, then Abraham would rather not offer up Isaac, and so forth. OK. Um, so importantly, the first condition doesn't yet distinguish an act that expresses faith in x, or faith that x, from an act that expresses a high credence that x. Um, so if we only included this first condition, then nearly every act would count as an act of faith. For example, um, a poker game, you, um, you know, you, there's like only one card that will come up that will um, make you win the hand, but you have to pay such a low amount of money uh, in exchange for the possibility of like such a high amount of money that it's actually like worth it as the probabilities work out. Um, so you decide to like put more money in the pot. It just doesn't seem appropriate to say that this is an act of faith that the three of clubs will come up. This just isn't some um, this isn't an act where faith comes in at all. It's just like this is an act um, based on the fact that that's the rational thing to do given the probabilities. Okay, so it seems like um, important second condition um, something having to do with evidence. So here uh, that the person goes beyond the evidence for x. And now um, the interesting question will be, in what sense does faith require going beyond the evidence? First of all, considering this analysis in terms of the framework of credences or degrees of belief, um, for one thing, that's the area I work in and I understand them better. Um, but also, I think that uh, at the end, I'll sort of say something about 
how belief figures in, um, how, how uh, rational faith relates to belief. Um, but all these sort of analyses can um, sort of be easily cashed out in terms of belief as well. So the fact that I'm doing it in terms of credence isn't like making a major difference to the presentation here as far as I can tell. Um, but all these analyses is sort of like based on, I, are sort of precisifications of ideas that have kind of been floating around, um, you know, maybe both in the, in the public sphere and in a more, um, more sort of technical sphere about what faith is. I'm going to argue that sort of our initially um, plausible seeming analyses of faith are in fact wrong, and then I'm going to argue uh, for my analysis of faith, and then I'm going to um, show you under what conditions such faith would be rational and why. Here's the, the first thought. This is like um, basic thought. There's this Mark Twain quote, um, faith, me uh, faith means believing what you know ain't true. Right, so this is like uh, here's like a a probabilistic kind of version of that, and maybe it's maybe it's not as like dumb sounding when you think about the probab probabilistic version. The idea here is that to have faith in something is to um, take the degree of belief based on the evidence and just bump it up a little bit. So um, here's the first analysis: faith that X requires believing X to a higher degree than you think the evidence warrants. Uh, more precisely, for an agent to have faith in X or that X, he must think that the evidence warrants believing X to some degree, say R, uh, but instead um, himself believe X to degree Q, where Q is greater than R. Um, and one extreme version of this, and you might think maybe this isn't so crazy as an anal analysis of faith, is that faith in X requires being absolutely certain that X, or assigning a credence of 1 to X, even when you think the evidence warrants less than certainty. Um, so here's an example of how this would work if uh, this is what faith is. Let's say I have faith that my friend will keep a secret. A third party tells me that my friend is a gossip. On this view, I do consider this to be evidence against my friend's trustworthiness, but I ignore it. So I think um, rationally, based on the evidence, I ought to say, believe to degree 0.5 that my friend is trustworthy, but um, I in fact believe to degree, I don't know, 0.9, uh, whatever. I believed before I um, received the evidence. OK, so um, I think there are some objections to this analysis of faith. And um, so, so I should say, when I'm objecting to these, I don't yet want to object to an analysis on the grounds that um, this definition of faith would make faith automatically irrational, because that's not going to be a valid objection, because it's not, it's sort of a question whether faith can ever be rational. So like, um, the, the licensed kind of objections in this case are that um, this concept of faith doesn't in fact fit with our ordinary notion of faith, either sort of in the well-understood case of faith in a friend, or in the um, theological case of faith in God. Um, so just sort of put that out on the table. So um, kind of primary objections to thinking of faith in this way, uh, keep in mind that when one is having faith in this sense, one thinks x is likely to degree r, but I believe x to degree q. So um, there are a couple objections to this. And the first is that um, when you consider the phenomenology of doing something like this, what it's like in the head to, to have this attitude, it seems hard to imagine someone actually having faith in this sense. And it seems especially hard um, for someone to recognize that he has faith in this sense and so, without um, that causing him to sort of like lose the faith. However, faith is not uncommon. And it, importantly, it doesn't seem to involve um, psychological tricks or self-deception. So the idea is that like, this would actually be a really, really hard attitude to maintain cognitively, but faith doesn't seem like a cognitively difficult attitude. Maybe it's difficult in other respects. Um, another sort of objection from the practices of, of uh, both religion and like interpersonal friendship, it's unclear that one can take steps to have faith in this sense or to maintain such faith. So it's not clear that uh, one's degrees of belief are actually under one's control. Um, but uh, what this requires is that if I, if I tell you you ought to have faith, um, take steps to have that faith, it's not clear what I'm asking you to do. You have like no idea how to do this thing. Okay. Um, but religious ethics and the ethics of friendship seem to require uh, cultivating or maintaining faith. So that would make 
uh, religious ethics and the ethics of friendship uh, require you to do something that's like not just impossible, but um, that you we sort of might not even be able to spell out what it is that you're doing. Okay. Um, so here's kind of a modification of this analysis that might make it seem a little bit more plausible. Um, this is the idea that having faith that X doesn't require you to bump up your belief, but what it uh, requires you to do is to act as if you believe more strongly than you do. Um, so an extreme version of this would say that having faith in X requires acting as if you are absolutely certain that X even when you think the evidence warrants less than certainty. So to go back to the example of um, the secret, uh, let's say I have faith that my friend will keep a secret. On this analysis, when a third party tells me she's a gossip, um, I, I again consider this to be evidence against my friend's trustworthiness. However, unlike in the first analysis, I in fact stop believing that my friend is trustworthy or I become less confident. Nonetheless, I act as if I believe that she is trustworthy. So even, for example, even though um, my confidence in her trustworthiness goes down, I continue to tell her my secret. Okay. Um, so again, I think there are some objections to this analysis. The first, again, has to do with the uh, phenomenology of faith or the sort of feel of faith. Um, on this analysis, faith requires simultaneously keeping track of two things. One's actual credences, credences based on the evidence, and one's faith-adjusted credences um, that one employs in decision making. Um, but it doesn't seem like the phenomenology of faith uh, involves a lot of mental accounting. Um, now, maybe this, is, this seems like perhaps uh, an objection that could be overridden because, you know, maybe we think that um, the mental accounting involved here is like under the surface. It's um, not so, uh, you're not so conscious of it. But I think there's like a much more important objection, and that is that um, if this is the right analysis of faith, then it would imply that the ethics of friendship and religious ethics require you to do things that um, neither of those domains seem to require you to do. So uh, on this analysis, the faithful person ought to make decisions, even moral decisions, that he thinks are unjustified by the evidence. And in the extreme version, he ought to risk anything on X. So um, it seems like, uh, let's say, I think my friend ought to have faith in my trustworthiness. I actually don't think it's morally required that she make a bet um, that will you know, lose her lots and lots of money if I, in fact, tell her secret to someone else, or to um, make a bet that, such that people will die if I spill a secret. Right? It seems like um, one can think, strongly think that friendship requires faith without thinking that friendship requires um, this kind of uh, uh, acting against the evidence that she has in my trustworthiness. OK. Um, so you might think that what's wrong with these first two analyses is that they um, put faith in the wrong place uh, relative to belief. Both of these analyses have faith coming after belief. So we sort of first figure out belief based on the evidence, and then we sort of do the faith thing once we've already figured out what our degrees of belief should be. But you might think that um, Rather than coming be, uh, going beyond the evidence, faith, in fact, comes before the evidence. So here is a third proposal. Um, here's the, the third analysis of faith, is that faith requires being certain before examining the evidence. Um, so faith involves deciding that no possible evidence could tell against X and examining the evidence in light of this decision. So for example, it might involve setting a uh, it, before looking at the evidence, setting your credence in your friend's trustworthiness at uh, one so that no evidence you get against her trustworthiness could possibly um, tell against that trustworthiness. So in our example, I have, my friend, I have faith that my friend will keep a secret. A third party says she's a gossip. Um, on this view, I don't even consider this third party's proclamation to be evidence against my trustworthiness or against my friend's trustworthiness, um, I assume the person must be lying or mistaken. Now, um, I do think this view has some advantages. For one thing, there's this kind of well-known problem in um, the epistemology that uses credences or degrees of belief, 
And that's that while we um, have a really good handle on how you ought to update your degrees of belief in response to new evidence, there's this problem of how I set my prior degrees of belief before ev any evidence comes into play. So sort of according to like one very standard view, as long as I don't have objective probabilities like the kind involved in flipping a coin, um, basically any prior probabilities are fine. So it's fine before I look at evidence to start with probability of my friend's trustworthiness as 0.9. It's fine to start with 0.1. So this is sort of uh, a way to give us a complete epistemology by saying, no, there actually is something that um, sets those priors. It's this thing that has maybe a moral dimension, namely faith. So um, I think there is some advantage to this analysis. And I think another um, advantage is that uh, we do sort of think that um, in the case where the third, where like somebody tells me my friend is a gossip, if I sort of just say, oh, okay then, I won't tell, uh, I won't tell her the secret, it seems like I've done something that reveals that I don't have faith in my friend. So this analysis um, would explain that. So I think it has some advantages. Um, nonetheless, I think there are some important objections um, to this analysis as well. First, we have a practices objection. Um, it seems like one uh, kind of big uh, mandate in religious ethics is humility and teachability, uh, especially in important religious matters. Um, so it seems like uh, religious ethics would not recommend kind of if you have faith in something that you ought to simply um, dig in your heels and not be willing to be moved uh, even when you have um, any evidence. Uh, so, so anyone who is acting on faith feels like she is taking a risk of some sort. But it seems like if one is certain that x is true, then doing an act A is not a risk at all. right? So if you, in fact, have a credence of 1 in some proposition, then you just ought to take any bet that um, gives you, say, a positive amount of money if x is true. And it, it, it won't count to you as a risky bet. It will count to you as, look, somebody's just giving me money for free because I know that this thing is true. I'm certain that this thing is true. But what, th what seems distinctive about taking a leap of faith, so to speak, is that you are fully aware that it might turn out badly, even if you think that it's unlikely that it will. So what's sort of distinctive about the fact that telling my friend a secret reveals faith in my friend or is an act of faith is that I'm sort of fully aware that the possibility is there that she might spill my secret. Um, finally, I think there is an objection that this definition is overly broad. Um, I mentioned earlier in the talk that uh, it seems like intuitively we do think some cases of faith are like good cases of faith. So you're, you've, uh, your friend has kept all your secrets in the past. Maybe it's good. Uh, it's fine to have faith that she'll keep the next one. Um, it seems like there are some cases of faith that are bad or misplaced faith. Your friend has always uh, told your secret every single time, and you have no indication that her personality has changed, um, yet you have faith that she'll keep your secret. Uh, it seems like this uh, is a case of misplaced faith, and we want to be able to capture this distinction, at least sort of intuitively now maybe it'll turn out that like all cases of faith are really irrational but it seems like there are cases of faith that at least have different status intuitively but this analysis just paints them all uh, with a single brush because there's just no way to tell the difference between propositions that you start out by assigning credence one to. So here's the um, sense in which I, th I think faith requires going beyond the evidence, and then we'll sort of turn this into a formal analysis. So I think there's something um, right about the fact that if uh, you have faith in your friend, then um, you ought not to um, ask a third party for advice. And I think that's because what faith requires is that you not engage in an inquiry whose only purpose is to figure out the truth of the proposition one purportedly has faith in. So um, some would say that uh, engaging in an inquiry reveals that you don't have faith in something. But I would I uh, argue that 
not engaging in an in inquiry is constitutive of having faith in something. So like that's the distinctive thing that faith requires. Um, so for example, um, let's say that one has faith that one's spouse isn't cheating. It seems like this rules out hiring a private investigator, opening her mail, or even striking up a conversation with her boss to check that she really was working late last night. If you're doing any of these inquiries for the sole purpose of um, getting evidence in the matter of whether or not she's cheating, it seems like you don't have faith in her. Um, similarly, if I have faith that my friend will keep a secret, it seems like this rules out asking a third party whether he thinks that friend is trustworthy. Um, now, I'm, I uh, don't claim to be a theologian by any means, so um, the actual theologians in the audience can sort of maybe speak to this more, but I, I will at least make the minimal claim that I think this is like pretty compatible with um, some of the things that are uh, written in religious scripture. And I think that this is also um, compatible with some of the things some theologians have said. I'm not going to say all theologians, because um, this is like one thing that, that they disagree about. So at the very least, I think this is like not incompatible um, with what uh, theologians have said. And, and I do think it actually provides a good an analysis of um, some of the, the sort of religious examples. So um, you know, one kind of example is you have doubting Thomas, who um, says, like, I won't believe unless I um, stick my hand in, in um, Jesus' side and feel the wound. Um, there's you know, a, places where um, Jesus complains that a faithless generation demands a sign. So you know, again, like, this isn't like analysis of the entire Bible or, or religious texts or anything like that, but I think it's, um, it's uh, at least minimally compatible. Um, so here's my analysis. I think that uh, faith in a proposition requires stopping one's search for additional evidence about the truth of that proposition and committing to a risky act on the basis of that proposition. So, you know, again, to go back to the friend example, if I have faith that my friend will keep a secret, um, when I'm deciding whether to tell her my secret, I can't first ask a third party if they think she'll keep it. Now, there's one important caveat here, which is that uh, it seems like sometimes the faithful act um, is actually to search for more evidence. So if you think of the, like, the apologist who's really trying to convince people that God exists, one thing he does is he like, goes and he examines all the historical evidence so that he can share it with other people. Um, and this seems like an act of faith, right? It'd be really bad if like, on this uh, analysis the apologist came out as lacking faith. So what's really important here is the purposes for which the person looks for the evidence. Um, so in the case of, let's consider like the act of um, going to church, the apologist um, isn't looking for more evidence to decide whether or not to commit to go to church. He's like fully committed to, go, go to going to church, but he's looking for evidence for other purposes um, and sort of more directly related to the search. It seems like... Um, Let's say the apologist were um, making a commitment to like speak, uh, giving an argument in favor of God's existence in two months, and he hadn't been to the library yet. Um, it seems like he would fully make this commitment without first going to the library because he thinks um, the evidence that I'm going to find is evidence that supports the existence of God. Um, I'm not going to look for the evidence to decide whether or not God exists. I'm looking for the evidence to sort of um, convince other people. OK. So uh, sort of formally, a person has faith that x expressed by a only if, um, first of all, performing act a constitutes taking a risk on x in a sense we've already discussed. And second, uh, that person chooses to commit to act a before he examines additional evidence rather than to postpone his decision about Act A until he examines additional evidence. And um, one sort of caveat, it seems like one might be in a situation in which there just is no way uh, to look for further evidence. So you might want to express this as a kind of counterfactual. So like, if there were more evidence available, the person um, would choose not to look at it. So if there were a private detective available to be hired, the person would choose not to hire the private detective. OK. Uh, to have faith is to stop one's search for evidence. 
about a particular proposition and commit to taking a risk on that proposition. Um, faith does require total commitment, but not to a belief. So not uh, in the sense outlined by analysis three, um, rather to an act. Specifically, one must commit to performing an act regardless of what the evidence reveals or would reveal because um, you're not looking at it. So one interesting upshot is that it's possible for two people to have the same evidence, the same degrees of belief, and value the relevant outcomes in the same way and to perform the same act. And yet one of the two people displays faith while, while the other doesn't um, because one of the people uh, first looks for evidence before performing the act and the other one doesn't. So there are really two acts relevant to having faith in X. There's the risky act that one bases on, act, uh, on X, the act A that expresses one's faith. And there's the act of refraining from gathering the evidence. That's like, that's uh, to refrain from gathering the evidence is to do the risky act faithfully. Okay, so um, if I am right about what it is to have faith, uh, the natural question is, under what circumstances is this attitude rational? And a sort of uh, related question is going to be, um, why is faith a virtue? Because it's sort of a, a puzzle that there's this attitude that's supposed to be like one of the great theological virtues and also a virtue in our interpersonal interactions. So if it's right that faith is a virtue, we sort of need an explanation. What is good about faith? One of these kinds of rationality is epistemic rationality. So epistemic rationality is rationality in the mat matter of what you do. And it's usually cast, uh, cashed out minimally as like your beliefs ought to conform to the evidence. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's rationality in what you do. This is usually called instrumental rationality or means ends rationality because it's about um, taking the means that best lead to your ends. Or as we talked about yesterday, since you know, in the ordinary case, you're deciding between um, two acts such that one might, might but uh, not with high likelihood, lead to something really good and some other act uh, will almost certainly lead to something that's not as good. Sort of, so uh, instrumental rationality is going to be slightly more complicated than just doing the act that uh, best lead, that um, gets you the thing you most want. It's going to be something more like uh, doing the act that given how likely you think the various outcomes are um, and how much you value the outcomes um, gives you the best chance of getting what you want or sort of on average uh, gets you the, uh, what you most want, so something like that. It's sort of like complicated to, to spell it out precisely, but the idea is that um, the values you attach to outcomes um, mesh with how likely you think various acts are to uh, lead to them, and there's going to be one act that like comes out better on, uh, on the, the, the scale. So importantly, we're not here talking about wanting to believe things regardless of whether they're true. So one reason you might think um, certain kinds of attitudes to propositions are instrumentally ration rational is because you think that like, Gosh, even if um, this thing is false, it like gives me a lot of hope or pleasure um, or comfort to believe it. So we're not talking about that. So in fact, let's just assume our agent is someone um, who gets no utility boost from believing X uh, if X is false. Maybe he gets some utility bo boost for believing the true things. Maybe he's like a scientist that just um, enjoys knowing the truth about things. But what we're primarily talking about is um, knowing the truth for the purposes of doing the act that's best, given what's true. So um, knowing whether or not it's raining for the purposes of um, deciding whether to bring an umbrella or not. What is uh, interesting is that if we use the framework of decision theory, then there are some formal results about when looking for more evidence is good for you in the sense that it um, roughly increases uh, the likelihood of your uh, choosing the act that gets you something you really want, and when looking for more evidence can actually harm you in the sense that it decreases the likelihood of that. Um, so here, and so I'm not going to go through the formal result. Obviously, um, if you're interested, I have some papers on my um, website about it. 
Um, but I am going to explain sort of why it's true, because it would be very frustrating if I just said, you know, sort of waved my hands and said, like, yeah, well, the math says that. So, you know, don't worry about it. Faith is rational at the end. Um, so here's the, the formal result. Uh, looking for more evidence can harm you in the specific situation in which you're choosing between two acts, A and B, such that A constitutes taking a risk on some proposition x in the sense that, you know, if x is true, like a is really good, if x is false, a is really bad, and the act b is neutral, uh, kind of either way. So think about like the act of becoming a monk uh, based on the proposition that God exists. Becoming a monk is really good if God exists, it's bad if God doesn't exist. On the other hand, not becoming a monk is like neutral either way. So we're thinking about in these kinds of situations when that's the choice you face, um, what are the conditions under which looking for more evidence can harm you? Well, looking for more evidence can harm you if the following four conditions are satisfied. Um, first, you already have a lot of evidence and on its basis have a high credence that X. Um, so, you know, you have a high credence and it's based on a lot of evidence so that this high credence is resilient in the face of um, some, some new evidence. Um, second, you're set to perform a risky act. I already talked about that. Um, third, the evidence you are considering gathering is such that if it tells against X, it won't tell conclusively. So um, here's an example of uh, an, uh, an event of evidence gathering that's like this. Let's say you, um, let's say a private detective comes to you and says, I have, uh, that you don't know where your spouse had dinner last night. I have pictures of your spouse having dinner with someone where she had dinner. Um, do you want to see them or not? So this is a um, gathering this evidence, namely looking at the pictures, is such that if it tells against your spouse's fidelity, it won't tell conclusively because this sort of like in the bad case, you see her like having dinner with a stranger you don't know. But obviously that's not like conclusive evidence that she's cheating on you or something. It just might lower your credence um, somewhat uh, that she's being faithful to you. Okay, and finally, uh, one of these two conditions is satisfied. Either postponing the act would be costly um, or you're risk averse in the, in the sort of specific sense that when you're considering um, uh, which acts to choose, you don't just weigh the average utility value of each act, but rather um, of two acts with the same average utility value, you prefer the one um, that uh, is less spread out or has a higher minimum or is less risky. Okay, um, so why is this true? Um, so here's the basic idea. More evidence is always going to help you in some sense, and it's always going to um, carry some possibility of harming you. So uh, on the one hand, here's how it helps you. Um, it always gets you closer to truth on some proposition. Um, so sometimes, and sometimes this helps you do what in fact turns out better for you. Um, so uh, take the case in which, like, let's say you already have, you have 0.9 credence that your, your spouse is uh, faithful to you. Um, let's say you looked in the envelope and there was a picture of your spouse like having dinner with somebody you know. Um, then this might slightly increase your credence um, so it'll like make you feel slightly better about the act of um, remaining married to that person uh, in the sense that it'll slightly raise the expected value of that act um, but only slightly. It'll also help in the following sense. If you get the bad evidence and the bad evidence leads you to not um, continue, uh, continue being married to that person, and the bad evidence is actually um, good in the sense that like your spouse wasn't being faithful to you, um, then it will help you in the sense that it leads you not to do the disastrous act um, that has a, a really low payoff of, of staying married to this person who's cheating on you. On the other hand, evidence can harm you in a certain way. Um, it could lead you to, to do an action that, though rational, given what you know, is in fact worse for you. Because it gets you farther from the truth on a proposition that matters more for the decision. So if um, looking in the envelope causes you to lower your credence, and it causes you to lower your credence in such a way that 
you no longer uh, want to stay married to the person, but the person was in fact faithful to you, um, that has harmed you because it's kept you from doing the act that's in fact better for you, even though it's um, even though like you acted rationally uh, uh, given what you uh, what you knew, um, because the evidence has. Uh, gotten you closer to the truth on the matter of who your spouse was having dinner with last night, but in doing so, it's gotten you farther from the truth on the matter of whether your spouse is in fact faithful to you because it's lowered your credence in that matter. So the basic idea behind the formal result is that um, these are situations in which more evidence for X won't help much, but evidence against X can harm you if it's misleading about which action you should do, and um, the evidence is fairly likely to be misleading. So this is why the fact that the evidence um, isn't conclusive sort of comes into play here. Okay. Um, so faith is rational in um, some very particular situations, namely if one has a lot of evidence for the proposition in question and if our evidential situation is such that counter evidence won't be conclusive. So what's important is that uh, the rationality of faith uh, actually depends on the character of the available evidence. If we're in a situation in which most of the available evidence is um, conclusive one way or another, then faith is not going to be rational. But if we're in a situation in which um, the character of the evidence we can gather is such that uh, if it tells against the proposition in question, it um, will tell inconclusively against that, then faith can be rational. Okay. Uh, here's the a separate question. Um, what about epistemic rationality? So the first thing to say is that on this analysis, faith doesn't require um, changing your credences. So just in terms of whether your credences conform to the evidence, um, faith, is, uh, faith doesn't require anything that's epistemically irrational. But there's going to be a question about whether um, gathering evidence is itself an epistemic virtue. So from the point of view of our epistemic duty, our duty in the matter of um, believing and knowing true things, ought we to gather more evidence? Um, so here I think uh, whether this is a virtue is going to depend. Um, if it's the case that knowing the truth about all propositions matters equally to you, so if you just uh, have this detached objective attitude such that what you're interested in is finding out the truth about anything you can find out the truth about, then it's true that gathering evidence is going to sort of, on average, get you closer to the truth. So that's a, a point in favor of thinking that um, in this situation, uh, gathering evidence is always required of you. But one... Um, thing to note is that just as in the case of action, more evidence can get you closer to the truth on one proposition, but it can get farther, get you farther from the truth in the matter of the proposition that your action is based on. Um, more evidence can get you closer to the truth in general while getting you farther from the truth on questions you care more about. So if we have this picture in which some questions are way more important to know the answer to than other questions, then um, you might be in a situation in which uh, you actually ought not look for more evidence because, say, you already have a lot of, you know, again, same conditions, you already have a lot of evidence in favor of some proposition. Any evidence that uh, you can gather, while it might uh, help you, it also might hurt you. Um, this is going to be a special situation in which, um, if that's like the one proposition that matters to you, uh, you could do worse from the point of view of knowing what's true by gathering more evidence. Um, and one way to uh, cash out this thought is that we might think that, um, we might think it, it makes sense uh, when we think about the relationship between belief and credence. Here's one thought we might have. We might think that um, in the matter of belief, we actually care uh, about believing some things more than about believing others, at least um, when we're in certain domains of inquiry. So you might think that we could assign different utilities to believing the truth about different propositions, and then sort of um, just 
use the framework we talked about earlier where different utilities are assigned to different outcomes, um, move it to this domain and kind of get the, get the same results. That's just, just one thought. Um, that might sort of not be the way you want to think about um, the fact that we ca sometimes care about uh, knowing the truth about one thing more than knowing the truth about um, something else. Okay, so um, one upshot here is that if you care equally about the truth of all propositions, as you think might be plausible in pure science, then gathering evidence and using it in forming your credences is something you should do. Um, but when we're thinking about uh, belief formation, when you care differently about knowing the truth in different matters, or decision making, gathering evidence and using it isn't always instrumentally rational even if you attach no value to having particular beliefs. So even if you're not the kind of person that engages in wishful thinking or would just like, like to be, believe the nice things even if they're false. Um, so again, the conditions for inquiry, uh, for sort of pure scientific purposes and inquiry from the point of view of practical or moral decision making come apart. Um, so just to sort of sum up uh, the sort of general point that's emerged from these two talks that I've given is that it seems like there are two different domains and the standards for these domains actually turn out different. So in the case of science, it's uh, given that the one point of science is to sort of objectively gather truth without caring about like some truths more than others. Um, and given that science doesn't uh, need to give a yes-no answer on many questions, but can instead just give um, a probability or a credence, it seems like in the case of science, uh, the framework is largely that of credences, um, and we ought to gather evidence so that uh, the attitude of faith is not actually required in the domain of science, and the sort of um, standard analysis, our sort of standard idea of like we ought to just always gather more evidence and that's always going to be helpful to us, um, turns out to be true. So that's what's going on in the domain of science. Um, oh, and, and sort of furthermore in the domain of science, um, the character of the evidence is generally um, more, such that it's more conclusive because there's just more evidence to be gathered. However, when we're thinking about questions of say religion, or morality or friendship, things are different. For one thing, these are domains in which our evidence is more sparse. So um, often there's going to be no conclusive evidence against the proposition that you're considering. Um, furthermore, uh, in these domains, we want to know the truth about things so that we can act. We want to do the act that's best given what's true religiously. We want to do the act that's best given what's true about our friends and about our spouses. Um, so in, in uh, these domains, um, sometimes the attitude of faith, the attitude of committing to decisions or even possibly committing to beliefs without looking for further evidence is in fact um, the attitude we should have. And it's the attitude that we should have precisely because that turns out to be what's rational in these domains not because there are different evidential standards in these domains. In both domains, the evidential standards are, you know, believe or have credences on the basis of the evidence, um, but because the character of the evidence is different and the norms involved in the domains are different, the what we're trying to do in the domains is different, um, the attitude of faith actually does have a place in these domains um, and it has a place for rational agents. Thanks. <laughs>